take a moment to stretch and shake hands and greet some of my love and let me find my Bible. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Anybody? The 20th year. 
20th year of what? Right? The 20th year of what? Well, it's the reign of King Artaxerxes, the current king on the throne, King Artaxerxes. And we see that in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, just a chapter over. It says that it came to pass in the month of Nisan, that's the first uh, month in the Jewish calendar, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. So there we go, the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. Uh, so that 20 years references to his reign. So we're 20 years into King Artaxerxes' reign. And King Artaxerxes is the sixth king of Persia. Sixth king of Persia, the, the Medes and Persian Empire that took over from the Babylonian Empire. The name Artaxerxes means whose rule is through truth. Whose rule is through truth. So, really good strong name as well. So we're 20 years in the King Artaxerxes' reign. This is when this occurs. So this, to put this in perspective, this is 14 years after Ezra was granted permission from King Artaxerxes to go to Jerusalem. Remember we talked about Ezra's prayer? So 14 years earlier was Ezra's prayer to go to Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 says, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nithiums unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of our search to the king. So that's how we can track the timeline from Ezra going to now talking about Nehemiah. And we all know that Nehemiah will also be going. So there's a 14 year span between Ezra travel to Jerusalem and Nehemiah's travel to Jerusalem. Where do we find Nehemiah? In Susa, yeah, the Sushan Palace. The Sushan Palace, this would be the Winter Palace of the Persian Empire. The Winter Palace for the Persian Empire. Sushan means lily, lily, the lily palace. <laughs> I don't know if there were any lilies there at the time. We know there's gardens. But uh, it means lily. The uh, modern city of Shush, Shush, Iran, is where we're talking about. So the modern city is named Shush. I mean, we're in present day Iran. Iran, of course, is, uh, if you go back to time, that's the Persian Empire. Iran, uh, Iranians are Persians. And so Shush. And so we are uh, by. By the crow flying, about 770 miles directly from Jerusalem. And look, it's directly east of Jerusalem. More or less directly straight on east from Jerusalem. And I tracked it. You can drive it. 919 miles of driving, 16 hours and 40 minutes. Get across to Iraq and through Jordan and uh, get to Israel. But uh, you can, it could be it's drivable. <laughs> but uh, if you did it all and, uh, without being stopped and anything else along the way. The site of Sushan. So here's Sushan, the Sushan Palace, as it looks like today. So it's an archaeological dig, pretty, uh, pretty significant in size. The site of Sushan was first located in 1851 by the British geologist William Loftus, who saw the extensive mound next to the Persian city of Shush and recognized it as the biblical city of Susa or as uh, Nehemiah called the Sushan. But it was the French who secured the excavation rights from the government of the Shah, and they dug around the mound, uh, the Acropolis and the Academia, or the palace area, from 1884 until the Iranian Revolution in 1979. So this is the result of these, these digs, uh, located in the Sushan Palace. Um, this is what people, a drawing of what it, uh, may have or would have looked like back in the day of uh, Nehemiah. Uh, and there's a lot of artifacts. Uh, and a lot of them are in a, uh, the museum in Europe, museums in Europe and so forth. But here's on the ground. Uh, pretty cool um, reliefs along with, along with staircase and ramp. And so here's maybe what it looked like back then. So, if you're familiar with the story of Nehemiah being a cupbearer, put yourself in that position. Okay. Where else have we seen the Shushan Palace in Scripture? Where else?
else does the pal this particular palace show up through scripture? Anybody remember? Anybody know? Esther. We get more about this palace through Esther than Nehemiah, right? We just know Nehemiah was at the Shushan Palace. Well, Esther, the whole story takes place basically at the palace, right? The whole story. So Esther chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Asarius, um, this is Asarius which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, Esther is describing the, the extent of the kingdom, the empire, over 107 and 20 provinces, 127 provinces were underneath, you know, were in this empire, that in those days when the king Asarius sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Sushan, the palace. Shushan palace. So immediately Esther starts off with uh, King Assyrius, which is also known as King Xerxes. King Xerxes. We find that the, this, the whole story of Esther is taking place here at the palace in uh, Shushan. The story of Esther, I think we talked about this before, fits, the story of Esther fits between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. Ezra uh, chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra has to deal with the first remnant of the captivity going back to Jerusalem, where they went and built the temple. That would have been with Zerubbabel, going back and build the temple. There is a 57-year period from when Zerubbabel goes and when Ezra shows up on the scene uh, between chapter 6 and chapter 7, and you plump Esther right in the middle there. So Esther, uh, the story of Esther would come before Nehemiah. So that's how this, that's how this fits. This so Ezra, of course, took this second wave, the second remnant from Babylon to Jerusalem. The 90 years of French work, let's see if it goes on. The 90 years of French work rescued many exquisite pieces of pottery and, and statuary that are now in the uh, Louvre Le 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 Museum in Paris but also produce a detailed plan of the palace which confirms the original descriptions in the book of Esther. Uh, we see the king's gate through which Haman had come to the palace from his residence to the city, the queen's garden which the king ran to contemplate what to do with Haman, Haman, Haman and the public in the inner court through which Esther would have had to pass to approach the king on his inner throne. We can observe that she had a garden next to her quarters by the harem, and the king had a large garden by the entrance so that the nobles uh, would go through uh, the king's gate. Uh, they did not pass through the palace itself on their way to the national feast. So, clearly, and we all know this, being solid biblical scholars, if the Bible says it, you can believe it. Archaeology, archaeology testifies to that. And so... This is uh, this, uh, this uh, archaeological dig testifies to everything that is described uh, about this palace, particularly in the Book of Esther. All right, where else is uh, the palace of Shushan mentioned? Did anybody else show up there in the palace? Daniel did. Daniel did. Daniel chapter eight, verse two. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, uh, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Eliah. So Daniel was there. Shushan became, um, let's go back here. So this vision would have been around the time when Daniel served under King Darius. So remember King Darius came after King Cyrus which came after them, uh, the Medes and Persians conquering the Babylonian Empire. Daniel served under many kings, second in command, and he was kind of a constant from one empire to another empire. And so if we want to know how to act in a sinful, fallen world, we look to Daniel. Because Daniel stays true to God's word, and yet God... Uh, elevated him and honored him in the position, and he was looked after for wisdom and guidance from, from one empire and many emperors that came through along his lifetime. 
But anyway, he would have been uh, under King Darius, so Daniel then would have been before Esther uh, in, a, in your timeline. And then King Darius would have been the Persian king to have originally built the palace at this site. He would have moved the government from Babylon to this location here to control the empire. And then, let's see if I have it. Daniel is buried there. Daniel's buried in Shushan and Shush, Iran. So this is a, a picture of uh, the site where people go to uh, pay homage to Daniel and Daniel's uh, coffin and so forth from there. So there's Daniel there. Esther is buried like 70 miles to the north in another city. But, uh, uh, Daniel is venerated, Esther is venerated by the Muslims uh, as well. And so, honored, very much honored. And then we want to talk about the Eastern Gate. Uh, during our Sunday school class, we talked about the Millennial Kingdom. We talked about the Eastern Gate. The Eastern Gate will be closed after, after Jesus enters into it during the Millennial Kingdom. Well, we know throughout history, the eastern gate was closed to somehow prevent the God of the universe from coming through. <laughs> like that will stop him. So this is so like this is the present condition of that gate. Uh, this gate uh, was built later. There's a, another gate underneath the ruins that we talked about, if you remember. Another gate. And so that gate is actually called the Shushan Gate. Uh, as Jewish tradition says, the Shushan Gate to commemorate the release from Babylonian captivity. So it was said that the gate's entrance bore an embossed sculpture of the ancient Persian summer palace. Rabbis have suggested that its purpose was to make the people ever mindful of where they came from and to commemorate the decree of Persian King Cyrus, who ended Israel's 70-year captivity and allowed the Jewish people to return to their land and rebuild the temple. So the Sushan, um, Shushan is also represented here in Jerusalem based off of uh, being released from captivity. Well, that's a lot of information <coughs> on uh, <coughs> what slide we'll leave it on. There's a lot of information there from the first verse. <laughs> alright, so let's get back to Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, let's get back to Nehemiah in the palace, alright? Verse 2, that Haniah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. So here we're introduced to another man, a man named Hananiah. And he comes into, he travels and comes back to Shushan. And we find Hananiah means gracious. Gracious. Nice name. And we find that he's Nehemiah's brother. His brother. We find that in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 2, which says, That I gave my brother Hananiah. So verse 2 of chapter 1 says that Hananiah, one of my brethren, it also could be translated literally one of my brothers, uh, instead of you know, one of my um, friends. friends, cousins, whatever, right? But it seems to be more directly a bloodline, blood connection. Nehemiah uh, looks like to be um, Nehemiah's actual brother. So Nehemiah chapter seven verse two says that I gave my brother Hananiah, and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem. So we know the story. Nehemiah didn't get to Jerusalem, and at some point he's gonna Nehemiah is gonna give basically charge. I don't know if you would call it governor or mayor or just in charge of the Jerusalem in general, but gave him authority in Jerusalem. Gave him charge over Jerusalem. But the latter part of that verse, chapter 7, verse 2, we see Hananiah's character, which says, For he was a faithful man and feared God above many. What a wonderful characteristics for Nehemiah's brother, right? What? And then think about it even more, the testimony of the father. The father had these, at least, these two sons, Nehemiah and Hananiah. And we know, we know Nehemiah and all the things that, we, if you study Nehemiah, everything you learn about Nehemiah. But we see his brother also has, was a faithful man 
and fear God above many. In other words, if you looked around a crowd, you would pick Hanai out and you say, that guy worships the Lord more. He fears him more, does more for the Lord than, than the others. And so this is, this is Hanai, this is Nehemiah's brother, the characteristics of Nehemiah's brother, a faithful man, one that feared God above all others. Wow, may, may we have that same characteristic as well, to be found faithful, and to be found dedicating ourselves to the Lord, committing ourselves to the Lord, which will clearly put us in heaven above of everybody else. So what did Nehemiah ask Kenaiah and the other men that came along with him? What did Nehemiah ask? Things yeah, how are things going, right? What's going on back in Jerusalem? How, what's happening with the Jews, as uh, as saying here, had escaped, had been released from captivity, had gone back to Jerusalem? What's going on with them? Tell me, I want to hear how things are going. And maybe Nehemiah uh, hasn't heard too much uh, what's going on. He's trying to get the, the low down from his brother who he can trust. And, and you know... Probably pretty exciting times. You know, the city must be a bustling city, must be doing great. The temple, worship, everything must be going fantastic. They're in Jerusalem. I wish they were in Jerusalem. But he gets a different response. He gets a different response. So, what was the re report that I gave his brother? Reflection. Great affliction and reproach. Yeah, so verse 3, And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. All this time, this is what's going on with Jerusalem. The people, the Jewish people that are there are being afflicted by the neighbors. They are, we talked about Ezra, when Ezra showed up, found that they were in sin and had married uh, foreign women and they were worshiping false gods. And so the report's not coming back so well. We find more details of structural, the infrastructure of Jerusalem, the walls broken down, the gates have been burned. There's, there's no infrastructure in place there in Jerusalem. And so backtrack a little bit. Uh, years earlier... Uh, so, when Zerubbabel went, he was given authority to build the temple and build up Jerusalem. Well, the neighbors got upset and sent a letter to King, Ar King uh, Xerxes. King Artaxerxes sent a letter back to King Artaxerxes. So, King Artaxerxes stopped everything, commanded nothing, everything to cease. Cease and desist, basically. A cease and desist letter. Ezra 4 2, 21 says, Give ye now commandment to cause these men to cease. And that this city be not builded until another commandment shall be given from me. So all these years they've been waiting for King Artaxerxes to issue a new commandment to build the city. Right now the city has been stopped and now the, the foreign nations are able to come and trace in and, and uh, you know, and afflict uh, the Jewish people. And this word has gotten back to Nehemiah. Um, so, question, how did Nehemiah take this news? How did he take this news? He was very distraught. Yes. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept more in certain days and fasted and prayed before God of heaven. But what did he do when he heard this news? He collapsed, sat down, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and ultimately he prayed before the God of heaven. I was uh, with Dr. Lin last night, and we were talking about a situation where a traumatic experience occurs, such as seeing, say, a, a, a fatality in a, in a car, a car wreck of some sort, and you witness it, and you are, you, uh, you're shocked, you know, so being a, like a, or like in your military, you have post-traumatic stress syndrome, so in that nature, there's a shock that occurs, and so he was telling me that uh, when that goes through, the person needs to just wait for seven days, hold for seven days, let the body do its thing because it's in shock. And not, don't try to force counseling and try to make yourself better right away. Let the mind heal itself, let the brain heal itself. And he was mentioning after seven days, then you can start, you know, hey, let's go to a counselor, let's talk through this, and so forth. And so he was telling me that counselors after like a, 
you know, that goes into school after a school shooting or something dramatic happens. You know, you want to tell the kids, hey, there's going to be a counselor on the scene, go see a counselor or whatever, or maybe a business, something happened in the business. Well, you tell me the counselors, what they should be doing is just telling you what you're going through is normal. And, and not provide anything to other counselors other than you're not different than anybody else. What you're experiencing is something normal and you need to let it process through, go through the grieving process. And uh, I was interested in, in seven days seem to be a, a trigger where if you do something earlier than seven days uh, when you're shocked in that nature, you may cause further harm, take longer to recover than just holding for seven days and then, then start the process to work through it. But uh, the interesting, the way the, the brain works, I was interested in the number seven, seven days in a week and so forth, but that's what he seemed to indicate. Anyway, we find here Nehemiah is in shock, right? He collapses, he falls, and he's mourning. He's literally grieving over the city. And maybe, again, maybe he was getting totally different news than it was anticipated, and he's just distraught. And so he's fasting, and what does he do, do that we all should be doing? That's going to the Lord in prayer. Going to the Lord in prayer. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. All right, we finally get to Nehemiah's prayer, <laughs> verse 5. And then, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy from them that love him and observe his commandments. We find Nehemiah knew he could do, do nothing about the situation. He had absolutely no control, but he knew who could. He knew who his control. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power. Brother, I want to go into song at the moment. And stretch forth, stretch out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Nehemiah knew where to go. The reference that Nehemiah makes to the God of heaven points out God's sovereignty over the universe. The reference to the great and terrible God points out God's majesty and awesome power. Remember the King James Version, the word terrible, we have a different connotation of terrible, terrible, and the King James just means awesome. Awesome. Of course, you probably don't want to be on the opposite side of awesome power. If you look like at the US military, we have awesome power. If you're on our side, it's terrible on the side, right? <laughs> but awesome power. And we find here, Nehemiah points out, this is the God who keeps his promises. This is the God who's merciful. This is the God that loved those that love him and obey him. This is that God. This is the God I'm praying toward. Verse 6. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Nehemiah points out, God, please be attentive to where, listen to me, hear my prayer, hear my prayer. And we find he's praying day and night. It's not some short prayer, it's not some short request, it's a pure burden, a pure begging to the Lord. Day and night, he pleads with God. You can see... The burden was great on his soul. The burden was great. Who gave Nehemiah that burden? The Lord. the Lord did, right? God did. You know, we watch the news every night and things are happening all over the world and, you know, we flip off the TV and go to bed. Did we have a burden? No. But maybe there's a, something news happens, something happens on the news and like, man, that's just grabbing me. God just giving us a burden. Nehemiah had a burden. He's been, well, we know he's been in the king's palace and he's heard report after report. No burden there, but this one grabs him. God has put a burden on his heart. God has put a burden on his heart. Maybe God has put a burden on your heart that you're praying through. He might confess the sins of the children of Israel and specifically included himself in that confession. He didn't leave himself out. Notice there. We have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We talked about Ezra's prayer, 
Ezra confessed himself also, Ezra 9, 15, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. We cannot stand before thee. So it's himself, yes? I was thinking about Nehemiah being in the presence of the king, and all the reports that came about Jerusalem were probably rosy because it's the king. Right. So he's thinking all these years everything's great. That's right. And now he hears reality. Right. So it was actually... Right. Right. That's right, brother. Daniel also similarly confessed his sins many years earlier. Daniel 9, 5. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly, have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which we, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Notice, we have sinned. We have sinned. When we're praying for the sins of the nation, don't exclude yourself. We're part of it. We have sinned. We have sinned. Nehemiah reminds God of his covenant. Verse 8, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Again, we see another prayer which includes God's promises into the prayer and holds on to his promises. And he's pulling from Leviticus 26, 27, which says, And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Verse 33 of Leviticus 26 says, And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Deuteronomy 28, 64 says, The Lord shall scatter thee among all the people, from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Here we have Nehemiah living in it. He knows he's been scattered. He's not living in Jerusalem. He's not living in Judah. He's living there in Persia. So he's been scattered. He knows. Verse 9. But, Nehemiah uh, 1 9 says, But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name therefore. He's showing the promise, Lord, you've kept your promise, you've kept your you know, commitment, we have sinned, you have scattered us, but you also promise we turn back to you, you will turn back to us, and you will set us rightfully in our place. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 says, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity, and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee to the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Nehemiah reminds God of his covenant to bring them back when they turn to him. Ultimately, no, that won't occur until the second of the coming of Christ, when the Jewish people call upon him. But here Nehemiah is praying for it now. Verse 10, Nehemiah 1, 10. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servants, and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupboard. We finally see Nehemiah ending his prayer with asking God for favor with King Artaxerxes. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, grant him mercy in the sight of this man, him being the king, King Artaxerxes. I'm in the sight of him. Grant me favor. Grant me mercy in front of him. So he's praying <clears throat> to the Lord knowing God has put me in this very specific location to be in front of the king. 
He's the one that can change. He's the one who can write the uh, authority to send another wave of people, another to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to send funds to take care of it. He's the one who can do it. He saw it with Ezra 14 years ago. He knows that King Artaxerxes is the one, so he's praying specifically that King Artaxerxes, that God would work on King Artaxerxes' heart. We find out what position did Nehemiah have in the palace. Cup bearer, cup bearer. I, I think those that are the closest, even though they're one of the lowest, are probably the friendliest to the king, right? Or the president, whoever that may be. The one that's always holding the door for the president, or the one doing whatever needs to be done. The one uh, they get to see the president the most. They know, they know the president. They know the king. And here Nehemiah knew the king. Well, though, you know chapter two where King Artaxerxes asks. Nehemiah, what's going on? That's uh, how close they were. But he's cut there. One interesting thing I found when I was in Santo Domingo, in the DR, uh, we toured Christopher Columbus's home, uh, or his son's home. Uh, a very interesting palace there. He was uh, set up to be governor over the Dominican Republic, over the, the island there. And uh, their tour guide was talking about uh, the taste testers, the cupbearers in the palace. And they, they, they would cook the food, the taste tester would taste the food, and they would wait, wait for an hour. And then if nothing happened to the taste tester, then the food would be served to, you know, the governor, in this case, the governor uh, and, and his family. Well, the taste tester got to taste hot food. What happens after an hour? Cold food. <laughs> Time you have to be a taste tester. <laughs> so, so Nehemiah. Yeah, but if there was poison in it, that was <laughs> <laughs> ah, Right, there you're done. You're done. <laughs> There's a bad sign. There's a bad sign. Right, right, right. Why couldn't the person who's going to poison it, why couldn't they do it after the hour? Right, that's the hour. <laughs> There's a secure, there's another breach in the system. I'm a little concerned. I got people thinking this through. <laughs> too many conspiracy shows you're watching on TV. Everybody like, cooks too. <laughs> I don't know why they couldn't keep it warm. I'm going to bring my own food next time. <laughs> anyway, Nehemiah had access to the king. And the king knew him, and the king knew the king was the only one who could change the orders and do something about Jerusalem. We also know by Nehemiah being in the position, God was already grooming him for a very specific and unusual circumstance that only someone in the palace could learn, and how to govern, how the wheels of government work, and he got to observe it right there and see how that works and be able to apply that to really where God wanted him to be. He's been in training, even though it's a cupbearer, he's been trained for something even more. And we can think of Joseph, similar story. Daniel, similar story, where God has him in a lowly position, but it's training him for something even far greater, when allowing, uh, Nehemiah allowing himself to be used of the Lord. So this is Nehemiah's burden for the city of Jerusalem, for the people for the Jewish people there in Jerusalem. This is Nehemiah's prayer going to uh, the sovereign Lord and the King of Kings. This is Nehemiah includes in his prayer the promises of God. And this particular time he makes a request, particularly for the king, that God would move the king to allow something to happen. Probably little did Nehemiah know, actually probably formulated in his mind, but little did Nehemiah know Nehemiah would be the one to carry out the burden God gave Nehemiah. Any questions, comments? Maybe God has groomed us. Those are uh, our senior saints. Remember, Moses was 80. It took 80 years to groom Moses for what God wanted Moses to do. So some of you are just now getting there. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Dear Father, we just praise you for today. We thank you for the prayer of Nehemiah. And what an encouragement, Lord. Lord, uh, that we go to you. Lord, we have burdens. Lord, may you... Work mightily in those burdens, Lord. Lord, may you be with our church. Lord, we're looking for a Spanish pastor. Lord, may you provide that man, Lord, and that family, Lord, that will come minister to our people, Lord, that we can 
grow the church, Lord, that you would grow the church, that you would bring people into the church. Lord, may you use your people in a mighty way. Lord, may you bless your people this week, Lord. Lord, give this all over to you. Jesus, amen. Amen. We have new prayer sheets, right, Miss Chris? Yes. Yeah.